Hello, I'm Sheldon Axler, the author of Linear Algebra Done Right. This video discusses the section of the book titled Invariant Subspaces. Let's begin with a quick review of notation and terminology. F denotes either the scalar field R of real numbers or the scalar field C of complex numbers. We let V denote a vector space over F. Note that we only have one vector space now, rather than the two that we had been considering. That's because in this section we will be working only with linear maps from a vector space into itself. We give such linear maps the special term operator. Thus an operator is a linear map from a vector space to itself. We also have special notation for such linear maps. We let L of V denote the vector space of linear maps from V to V. The reason for this emphasis on linear maps from a vector space to itself is that we can develop special tools for the study of such maps. For example, if we have a linear map from a vector space to itself, we can square it or raise it to a higher power. That will lead to interesting results, as we will see. To motivate our next definition, suppose T is a linear map from V to V. We will try to investigate T by composing the vector space V into a direct sum of smaller subspaces, and then looking at T restricted to each of those smaller subspaces. The notation used for the restriction of a linear map to a smaller subspace is shown here. The idea of restriction is easy. We are just reducing the domain of T to a smaller subspace. However, we will be developing some theorems about linear maps from a vector space into itself, in other words, about operators. If we want to apply those theorems to T restricted to a subspace U sub J, we need to make sure that T restricted to U sub J maps into itself. In other words, we are led to the following definition. Suppose T is a linear map from V to V. A subspace U of V is called invariant under T if whenever we take a vector in U and apply T to it, we end up with another vector in U. Let's look at some examples of invariant subspaces. Suppose T is a linear map from V to V. Then the subspace consisting of just 0 is invariant under T. The reason for this is that T of 0 is equal to 0. Our next example is the statement that the whole vector space V is invariant under T. That's because if we take a vector in V, then T of that vector is also in V, by the definition of T being a linear map from V to V. Our third example is the null space of T. The reason this subspace is invariant is because if we take any vector in the null space of T, then T of that vector is 0, which is in the null space of T. Thus, T maps the null space of T into itself. Our fourth example is the range of T. If we take any vector in the range of T, then T of that is also in the range of T, and hence the range of T is an invariant subspace of T. Note that these four invariant subspaces are not necessarily all distinct. For example, if T is invertible, then the first and third subspaces are equal, the null space of T is 0, and furthermore, if T is invertible, then the range of T is equal to the whole space V, so the second and fourth subspaces listed here are invertible. Let's look at an example of an invariant subspace for specific operator T. Our operator T will be defined on the vector space of polynomials with real coefficients, and we define T of a polynomial P to be the derivative p prime. The subspace p4 of r consists of all polynomials with real coefficients and degree of most 4. This subspace is invariant under t, because if we take a polynomial with degree of most 4, then its derivative also has degree of most 4. In other words, if we have a vector in p4 of r, then t of that vector is also in p4 of r. Thus, p4 of r is an invariant subspace for t. Let's consider the simplest possible invariant subspaces. 
Well, the simplest subspace is the subspace consisting just of zero. But that's not very interesting and will not tell us any information because if t is a linear map, then t of zero is equal to zero. Thus, let's consider one-dimensional subspaces rather than just the zero-dimensional subspace. Suppose we take a vector v and v that's not zero, and we let u equal all scalar multiples of v. Then u is a one-dimensional subspace of v, and furthermore, every one-dimensional subspace of v is of this form. Suppose we have a linear map t from v to v. We can ask what it means for u to be invariant under t. Well, the vector v is in our subspace u, Thus, we need for t of v to be in u. But u is all scalar multiples of v. Thus, t of v needs to be a scalar multiple of v. With a little bit of thought, we see that our one-dimensional subspace u is invariant under t if and only if t of v is equal to some scalar multiple of v. We now have good motivation for our next definition, which is one of the most important definitions in linear algebra. Suppose t is a linear map from v to v. A scalar lambda is called an eigenvalue of t if there exists a vector v other than zero such that t of v is equal to lambda v. The first time you hear this word eigenvalue, it may seem a little strange because the word is half German, half English, but you should get accustomed to hearing this word frequently. Now let's look at some conditions that are equivalent to being an eigenvalue. Suppose v is a finite dimensional vector space, and t is a linear map from v to v, and we have a scalar lambda. Then the following four things are equivalent. The first one is that lambda is an eigenvalue of t. The second is that t minus lambda i is not injective. Here i denotes the identity map from v to v. We can see why these first two conditions are equivalent if we look at the equation defining an eigenvalue. That equation is t of v equals lambda v. That equation is equivalent to the equation t minus lambda i applied to v is equal to zero. Since we are requiring v to be non-zero, the equation t minus lambda i of v equals zero implies that t minus lambda i is not injective. Thus, we have the equivalence of the first two conditions shown here. The equivalence of the last three conditions follows from one of the important theorems we've previously discussed about linear maps from a finite dimensional vector space to itself. That theorem said that the last three conditions are equivalent. Specifically, an operator from a finite dimensional vector space to itself is invertible if and only if it's injective, if and only if it is surjective. Thus, we have the equivalence of the last three items. Let's look at an example to illustrate the definition of eigenvalue. Suppose t is the operator on R2 defined by t of x, y equals minus y comma x. This operator sends the vector 1, 0 to the vector 0, 1, and the vector 0, 1 gets sent to the vector minus 1, 0. If you think about it for a minute, you will see the t is counterclockwise rotation by 90 degrees about the origin in R2. It certainly does that on the two basis vectors just discussed. Now recall that an operator has an eigenvalue if and only if there's a non-zero vector that gets sent by the operator to a scalar multiple of itself. 90 degree counterclockwise rotation of a non-zero vector clearly never equals a scalar multiple of itself. Thus, we conclude that this operator t has no eigenvalues. Let's look at another example to illustrate the definition of eigenvalue. This definition also shows the importance of keeping track of what the scalar field is. Suppose t is the operator on C2 defined by t of w comma z equals negative z comma w. This operator looks very much like the operator in our previous example, except now we're operating on C2 instead of R2. Thus, the variables have been called W and Z instead of X and Y. 
Notice that t of the vector 1 comma negative i equals i comma 1, which is equal i times the vector 1 comma negative i. In other words, t maps the vector 1 comma negative i into i times itself. Thus i is an eigenvalue of t. Also, we see that t of 1 comma i is equal to negative i comma 1, which is equal to negative i times the vector 1 comma i. Thus t of 1 comma i is equal to negative i times itself, which means that negative i is also an eigenvalue of t. You may want to pause the video and verify, using just the definition of eigenvalue, that this operator t has no eigenvalues other than i and negative i. We have defined the term eigenvalue. Now we need to define one more half-German, half-English word. Specifically, suppose t is a linear map from v to v, and lambda is an eigenvalue of t. A vector v in our vector space v is called an eigenvector of t corresponding to the eigenvalue lambda if v is not equal to 0 and t of v is equal to lambda times v. Let's look at an example. Suppose t is the operator we saw on the last slide on C2, meaning t of w comma z is equal to minus z comma w. Then the vector 1 comma negative i is an eigenvector corresponding to the eigenvalue i because t of 1 comma negative i equals i times that vector. We have now introduced two new words, eigenvalue and eigenvector, that sound somewhat similar. However, it's easy to remember which one is which, because eigenvalue is a value, meaning a number. It's a scalar, an element of whatever our scalar field is. An eigenvector is a vector. It's an element of our vector space. In this example, our eigenvalue is the number i, and our eigenvector is the vector 1, comma, negative i. When we have an eigenvector, then any non-zero scalar multiple of it is also an eigenvector corresponding to the same eigenvalue. You can see that easily in this case, for example. Suppose b is a complex number other than 0. If we multiply both sides of the equation showing that t of 1 comma negative i equals i comma 1 comma negative i, we see that t of b comma negative bi is equal to i times that vector. Thus, b comma negative bi is also an eigenvector corresponding to the value i. This always happens by linearity. Now we come to an important result. Suppose t is a linear operator on v. A result says that if we have a list of eigenvectors corresponding to distinct eigenvalues, then that list of vectors is linearly independent. Let's look at the proof of this result. We'll denote our eigenvalues lambda 1 up to lambda m and the corresponding eigenvectors will be v1 up to vm. Remember, we are assuming that these eigenvalues are distinct, and we want to prove that the corresponding list of eigenvectors is linearly independent. So suppose it's not true. This will be a proof by contradiction. Suppose our list of eigenvectors is linearly dependent. By the linear dependence lemma, one of the vectors is a linear combination of the previous one. So let's choose k to be the smallest positive integer, making this true. To say that vk is in the span of the previous vector says that we can write vk as a linear combination of the previous vectors. Now apply t to both sides of the equation at the bottom of the left-hand column and use the fact that each v sub j is an eigenvector for eigenvalue lambda j, so t of v sub j is equal to lambda j times v sub j. That gives us the, equa the equation displayed here. Multiply both sides of the first equation, that's the one at the bottom of the left-hand column, by lambda k, and then subtract our two equations, getting the following equation. We have now written 0 as a linear combination of the vectors v1 up to vk minus 1. However, v1 up to vk minus 1 is a linearly independent list because we chose k to be the smallest positive integer so that we could write vk as a linear combination of the previous vectors.
Thus all the coefficients in the last equation must be zero. And because the lambda 1 up to lambda k minus 1 are all distinct from lambda k, this means all the a's have to be zero. But now, if we look at the equation at the bottom of the left-hand column, all the a's being zero implies that vk is zero, but that contradicts our hypothesis that vk is an eigenvector. Recall that eigenvectors, by definition, are non-zero. We've reached a contradiction, thus our assumption that v1 up to vm was a linearly dependent list is false. We therefore conclude that the list v1 up to vm is linearly independent. We now come to an excellent corollary of our last result. This corollary says that if we have an operator on a finite dimensional vector space, then it has at most as many distinct eigenvalues as the dimension of the vector space. Let's look at the proof. Suppose v is finite dimensional and t is a linear map from v to v. And suppose we have lambda 1 up to lambda m as distinct eigenvalues of t. Let v1 up to vm be corresponding eigenvectors. Our last result said that the list v1 up to vm is linearly independent. But we know that any linearly independent list in a vector space has to have length less than or equal to the dimension of the vector space. That completes the proof. By the way, if you've previously taken a linear algebra course and you've seen a proof of this result using determinants, then you can see that this proof is much simpler. Determinants are complicated and not particularly intuitive. In contrast, this proof uses just the notion of linearly independence. This concludes the video on invariant subspaces.